The London Auto Services is a uh, small automotive repair shop. We work on a bunch of different cars, but mostly we work on Triumphs, MGs, Austin Healey's, uh, various other uh, old British sports cars. Or at least my specialty is the British side, and uh, we are doing the uh, Triumph Club tech session today. So we're going to go over a uh, British car, uh, probably a TR6, and um, check it out for um, whatever defects we can find on it. So we like to do what we call a pre-purchase inspection or a post-purchase inspection. And either one of those um, <clears throat> it should give you enough information about your car to either decide to sell it if you have it, or perhaps keep it, or if it's a, uh, if it's a, a pre-purchase inspection, whether you're gonna buy it or not buy it, depending on uh, the problems that you might find. And we're gonna be looking at trying to find out what those problems are, if they are there. <laughs> Dave is going to be our stellar uh, going around pointing out what the, what's uh, wrong with the cars and saying this is what you have to do, this is what you should do, this is what you should look after, and bring it to me and I'll repair for you. And then Nick here is uh, the owner and he is uh, going to say a few words which is, is limited. <laughs> I'm uh, Nick. Uh, I'm the last guy standing from, you know, three uh, three total partners. We took it over in '78. London Auto was started in 1967 by Mick Barker. When we bought it in '78, he wouldn't work on Italian, German, and Japanese cars because he fought against the bastards in the war. <laughs> he was 12 years old during the Battle of Britain. He may have seen a dogfight or two on a hill or something, but. He did not want to work on modern day cars and he wanted to tend himself to simple British cars, which meant MGBs, TR6s, Spitfires. He wouldn't work on a V12 Jag because it was too many cylinders for him. And it's probably because he was slowing down. Uh, I don't want to work on electric cars. I know they're coming. I do hybrids already, but I'm not going to sit down and say I, I don't want to look, but I prefer working on what I have here. Uh, you know, they're, they're fun cars, uh, there's a lot of competition, but you can thank British cars for all the German, Italian, and Japanese cars after the war because our GIs came back carrying English sports cars, and that's what got this whole trend started. So we'll credit the British with something, all right? But I obviously work on Italian, German, English, and Japanese cars. One because I'm Italian, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, they're, they're all fun cars. When I worked at Manhattan Auto and the three of us left there, we wanted to work on all the cars that Manhattan worked on. I liked working at Manhattan. We used to complain, but it was great days. They gave me free education on Triumph and G's. They sent me to Alpha School. They, they paid and took care of their mechanics. A lot of the mechanics took advantage of that. I didn't. I really went to the classes. I, I was very pleased with it. So it was kind of fun. So we brought in the Germans and the Italians. So as you look around the shop, yeah, there's a Jaguar. You know, we love our Jags. The Alpines, um, you know, another English car. But you see a Giulietta back there. You'll see uh, a Du Chevaux. Uh, you know, we decided to let the French cars in just to make them happy. <laughs> but uh, Du Chevaux are fun to work on. So we enjoy what we're doing. So uh, with that, I guess I turn you over because John told me to keep it short. <laughs> so with a pre-purchase inspection, what we like to do is uh, go out and drive the car first and get a feel for its uh, karma. <laughs> okay. uh, anyway, just driving a car will give you a good feel for uh, you know, whether it feels solid, whether it feels good to you. You know, if it feels like it's rattling around a lot and when you turn a corner or you've got a little dip in the road, whether, you know, it stays solid or it moves around a little bit. Uh, a lot of times, that's all I need to do to be able to tell you whether you've got something that really you don't want. Uh, if if uh, some of those indicators look really bad. Uh, both of these cars, 
uh, drove out pretty nicely. Um, I was looking at uh, uh, oil pressure and things like that. Oil pressure is good on both these cars. Uh, Bill Box car, this is Pete. Pete, uh, where are you? Oh, um, what's your last name? Deuce. Okay, Pete. Is <laughs> it <laughs> Peter or Pete? Okay. Just don't call me late for dinner. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so, the only things I really noticed on the test drive were um, the idle's a little bit high, uh, the oil pressure looks like it's good, the coolant temperature looks like it was running a little bit high on this thing, and I noticed it was varying around a little bit. It went from maybe three quarters and went up just a tiny bit from that. Um, the horn does not work. And um, do you have an extra horn button? Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, I noticed she's got an aftermarket steering wheel and sometimes uh, trying to get the aftermarket steering wheel um, horn switch set up correctly can be a, a little bit difficult. It takes, you know, it's, it's not set up perfectly to be able to put the, the wheel on and just go. You've got to do a few things. Um, when I had it on the ground, uh, one of the things that you do is, you know, you go around to the four corners and just try and do a bounce test on the car. Uh, Bill's car passed it pretty well. Um, Pete's car, uh, Pete, I think you're going to probably need rear shocks. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but, you know, when this thing's on the ground and you push down on it, it wants, it'll, it'll bounce like crazy. Um, and you'll notice it also a little bit in the way it rides when you go over a bump or something like that, you know, it'll kind of move around a little bit. The other thing that we noticed uh, when I brought it in, uh, one of the guys noticed that uh, uh, one of your lights was on in the back. And when I turned the key on, it looks like what's supposed to be the brake light uh, is on all the time. And the brakes, the brake lights don't work. Right. So uh, I've got an electrical problem with that. We turned the um, uh, regular lights on. Um, and Everything works except for the left rear corner here. So uh, there are probably some some uh, hookup problems. You know, obviously, if the brake light uh, brake switch is shorted so that it's on all the time, that's a problem. But it should also turn the other light on. If it's doing that. So you may have a light out in the right hand side, and you've got electrical problems on the left hand side. And also, we've got problems, obviously, with the brake light switch. I would check grounds first. That's yes, that is. A very famous on these cars. The, the wonderful um, way that they put the bulb sockets together on these things is, is uh, they've got two metal pieces that they stick together and then they put plastic around them to hold them together. What happens is you get corrosion between those two, those two pieces of metal. One of them is part of the bulb socket and the other one is supposed to ground against the uh, lamp. So if you've got corrosion between the two, the ground disappears and the lights don't work. Or they'll, you know, one will work very dimly or, you know, some combination there. Um, Can I ask you about the uh, shocks issue? Yes. Will that affect, this car has some bad negatives. Okay. The shocks, no. straight those wheels on. No. The shocks on this car, all they do is, is um, dampen the motion. Uh, the car is held up and, uh, by the springs and also um, the alignment, basically, of the, uh, the big um, trailing arm down there. Uh, I didn't notice any really bad negative camber, but you know, most of these TR6s seem to have a fair amount of negative camber. And you can uh, you can take care of that. There is a kit. Um, Richard Good, Good Parts. Yeah, they have uh, adjustable uh, trailing, yeah, arm. trailing arm mounts. And with those adjustable trailing arm mounts, you can take that out. You can actually adjust it on the car. When we look the car over, um, one of the things that uh, that we like to do is. Uh, pressure test the cooling system just to make sure that you don't have any leaks now. Uh, on your car, uh, the, 
the temperature was running a little bit high. So I'm just wondering. I think that's a voltage regulator ratio because it's been tested at 180 degrees, 180 degree thermostat in there. And that's what the block needs. Yeah, you've got plenty of coolant. The coolant, usually what happens um, if you're overheating is it'll push coolant out. Um, you've got a catch bottle over there, but um, this, I'm not sure. Yeah, there is some there is some coolant in there, but uh, if it was running that warm, it would probably actually overflow the, the catch bottle as well. So that's just one thing to look at. Now, the, you were talking about the uh, the voltage stabilizer. Yeah, the voltage stabilizer also um, works the uh, gas gauge. So if gas you're noticing works. that that both of them are a little weird. Well, it's pretty obvious you don't really have any um, obvious coolant leaks. Uh, we obviously look, we look for um, uh, obvious oil leaks and things like that. Now, one of the things I did when I had it up in the air, uh, one of the famous things that the uh, TR6 does is uh, they heat the um, thrust washers up. So the test for that is to, to try and pry the front pulley forward and back and see how much, how much play you have. The, the actual specification is supposed to be something like 8,000. Um, a lot of these cars have a whole lot more than that, but um, uh, it's not until it gets to uh, I don't know, 50 or 60,000 that you can really start worrying. Um, and a lot of times uh, you'll also see the um, uh, problem with the clutch when the, when the thrust washers start to get really warm. Um, you won't be able to push the clutch bar up in. As soon as you start to push the clutch in, it pushes the crankshaft forward. So you lose a little bit of, of your uh, the throw on your, on your pedal and on your uh, release pressure. So sometimes that's an indicator also. Now that's something that you probably want to check. You know, each of you might want to check that on your cars just to make sure. One of the things that um, you like to check is to make sure you're getting full throttle. Pete, you're getting full throttle. Bill, I was surprised to see right here, that um, you're only getting about uh, four fifths throttle. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we want to give you that extra fifth or not. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that we like to do is uh, check the compression on the car. Um, I'm not sure if we really will need to do that on this car. On both of these, uh, a lot of times you can get a, an idea of what the compression is yourself. First of all, uh, when you go to start the car, if the, the, uh, the rhythm of the starter turning over, and that's obviously before it starts, you know, and the, the test you would probably on a cold day, you'd leave the choke in and you would crank it so that uh, it wouldn't start right away. But if you hear this nice even beat, then that's uh, an indication that the, uh, the compression is relatively the same across all the cylinders. You know, if, if you hear this uh, uh, sort of a different cadence where it'll crank along and then it will kind of like um, uh, get faster and then slow back down again, that's probably an indication that at least one of your cylinders is the compression to get lower. Or is, or is low, significantly low. And let's see, what else do we want to look at here? Uh, we know about the clutch problems on these cars. I'm sure you guys have uh, um, probably done a lot of um, investigation online. Uh, one of the things that happens on these is the uh, the clutch pedal uh, clevis hole starts to get worn out. Uh, or the, the fork that's on the back of the clutch master will start to wear out and start to elongate. So what will happen is your pedal will go down maybe a half an inch or maybe an inch or sometimes more before you start to feel you know, any, any pressure and start to feel resistance. And all of that extra play is uh, motion that's not being imparted to the release bearing. And the release bearing on these things, you know, they've had their problems as well. But, uh, 
the, the first indication that you're having a problem would be having trouble getting it into reverse. Since that is a non-synchro air on this thing, uh, if you're starting to notice a grinding when you try and put it in reverse, that's probably the first indication that you're having a problem uh, with, the, with either the clutch or the clutch hydraulics. Most of the time, thankfully, this is um, the, the problems are with the clutch hydraulics. Uh, they have a tendency to, uh, to leak. The master cylinders leak out the back. The slave cylinders will leak. Another thing that we notice a lot is on the braking system, and uh, Pete, your brakes felt pretty good. Um, Bill, your pedal is down just a little bit. Maybe in a rear brake adjustment, but without that. Um, the master cylinders have a tendency to leak out the back of the master cylinder and leak into the booster. Um, the way to, you know, one place that you can look at that is right underneath the master cylinder up against the booster. And this one looks pretty dry. It's nice. Actually, this booster and master look like they've been recently replaced. I replaced that and luckily the fourth leg is correct. I put it on it. Yes. Adjust it. <laughs> yeah, and I noticed it's got a pretty good action as well. Uh, and you really feel the, the boost on it. But um, that's one place that they leak a lot. The other place is the rear wheel cylinders. Um, on almost all the British cars, I think in, in like 40 some years of doing uh, rear brakes on these cars, only maybe five or six times have I ever seen the rear brakes actually worn out, whereas the shoes are worn out. <laughs> About 99.9% of the time, what's happened is the, mat, or the wheel cylinder is leaking, and it's soaked the shoes um, with brake fluid and rendered them um, unusable. Or yes, I want to just uh, mention letting these cars sit. If you let them sit for any length of time, though, what happens is uh, the brake fluid absorbs water. At least the standard fluid does. The silicon fluid uh, doesn't, but that's a whole other story. But you develop little pits in the in the wheel cylinders and also in the master cylinder. And when you when you go to use the brakes, you know you push those seals through those little pits. And they're they're pretty small to start with. And, you know, obviously the longer you let the, let the car sit, the, the more you're going you're gonna to see that. But um, just a warning about that. The other warning, as far as letting a car sit, is the uh, gasoline. Uh, with the new ethanol fuel, you know, what's it been 20 something years now <laughs> that we've had the ethanol fuel? Well, not only does it have a tendency to kind of uh, deteriorate some of the rubber uh, faster than the normal fuel would, uh, it also goes bad much quicker. Uh, in the old days, back before the ethanol fuel, uh, you know, gasoline would, would be good for like a couple of years. And uh, what we're seeing now is the gasoline is, they're telling us it starts to deteriorate at six months. But if you let it sit for like a year or a year and a half, then there's a definite difference in the, in the fuel. And we get a lot of cars that have only been sitting for a couple of years, and one of the first things we want to do drain the fuel system out and flush it out uh, and put fresh uh, fresh fuel in. Uh, one of the things that you can do if you're going to let it, your car sit, and, and I would even recommend it if you're going to let it, you know, if you put it away in like November and you're not going to bring it out until May, is, is use um, uh, stabilizer. stabilizer, fuel stabilizer, yes. Now, Pete, I noticed your tank has got some spots of rust in the bottom. Um, it's not real serious, um, and as long as you don't let the car sit, you'll probably be fine. Um, these uh, gas tanks seem to, uh, they will rust out in the bottom, unlike some of the other cars, like the MGB rusts on the top of the tank, so it rusts from the outside in. These will usually rust from the inside out. Uh, because water will sit in that seam at the bottom of the gas tank, and um, it'll, it'll rust out. 
Uh, the other place that these things like to uh, leak is the fuel sending unit. Uh, there's a cork gasket on that, and uh, while it's on the top of the TR6 tank, you know, if you fill it up all the way and then you notice that you're smelling an awful lot of fuel, probably that's what the is working. When it's not completely full, you take a, you know, a couple hard turns and you suddenly notice that you're smelling a lot of gas. If you're not seeing it up here someplace, then more than likely it's, it's the uh, fuel sending unit. Can you address, address that loss <laughs> your, your best bet out there, I wouldn't do anything about that. I, I, I think you're probably, yeah, well, <laughs> let's fix the things that are, you know, that you can fix sort of semi easily important and keep you on the road. Um, the kind of rust that you have, and you can just shine a flashlight in there and you can see it. You've got little spots on that, but it's not like deep rust. Um, yeah, so you're, you're probably fine. I'm going to look at his throttle shafts and see what kind of play we have. We've got some play in there. It's a little bit of play. It's hard to see. There is some play there. That's not too bad. Um, as these cars get older, uh, you know that that throttle shaft is you know uh, moving in the bore many many times, and finally, eventually, what happens is. And these are brass shafts, and eventually what will happen is the brass will start to wear away on the, uh, on the shaft itself. And what, what it causes is uh, throttle plates will not always uh, come back to the same position. So we'll start to get, uh, uh, the idle will start to get in that. You know, sometimes it'll be fine, sometimes you'll notice that uh, uh, just some of the idle is a little bit higher, unfortunately it's a little bit low. Uh, Notice that there's a little bit of moisture on the bottom of the uh, on the bottom of the carburetor. Let's see. Is there anything else we want to talk about? Some of the things I noticed that it looks like the your motor mounts have got a little bit of uh, dry rotting on them, but they, they look like they're nice and solid. shows uh, Pete's got a uh, sport coil and a sport coil is okay on this car but somewhere in 72 or 3 or maybe 4 uh, they changed the, uh, the ignition circuit and the ignition circuit then had a resistor wire to it so if you put one of these sports coils in and these sports coils are internally ballasted uh, if you put a sport coil on a uh, later uh, a later car, you're basically double ballasting your ignition system. So, uh, you know, you, you get this sport coil to get more spark, but you're reducing the voltage that's going to it, so you get less spark. So you maybe might be getting as much as you would on a, on a standard coil. So if you've got a sport coil on your car and it's like a 73 or up, then uh, you may want to change it over to an unballasted coil. I like a rattier car because uh, that way we've got more things that I can actually show you. Uh, actually, let me look at one thing I want to I want to look at here. Uh, it's something that happens on these cars a lot, and that is the uh, uh, the steering rack bushings. The bushings that actually hold the steering rack uh, onto the car. Uh, they're rubber bushings, and uh, these. These are pretty good. Well, this is another issue. The, the, um, uh, ah, here we go. <laughs> no, this, this, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> this guy right here, um, this, one, this one looks like it's been replaced. Uh, but oftentimes we'll find these cracked. But this one looks really good. 
a little bit of up and down motion. Yes. That well, that's the that's the bushings that are actually in the steering column, and, and these are these are well, yeah, it's pretty worn, but but it's not horrible. I mean, you're not going to, you know, it, it'll get finally to a point where it'll irritate you enough that you might want to do something about it. Um, but what I was talking about is the, and I, I don't have a laser pointer, but um, it's the the bushings that are down. Actually, there's one on the other side you can look at too. It's right, it's right here, right there. And if you look at that, I'll move the steering wheel. You'll see it moves just a little bit. Can you see that? Orange bushing. Yes, that orange bushing. It's not the bushing that's moving. It's the steering rack. Now this has got a little bit of wear in it, but it's not bad. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do anything about this. Um, but they often get much worse, and when they do, uh, you'll notice that, that uh, the steering wheel um, has got a fair amount of play in it, you know, before you get, what, what happens is we turn the steering wheel, what happens is um, you're moving the rack itself, and then finally it'll get to the, to the point where it'll start to move the wheel. But anyway, so that's something that happens a lot on these cars. So one of the things I noticed is um, Pete's got a, uh, a header on this. And it looks like sometimes when you, when you put a header on these things, um, it makes it really difficult to get the starter out. But it looks like Pete's starter is one of the slightly shorter ones. It seems like these starters come in all kinds of different sizes, lengths, that is. <laughs> And uh, on some of these, what happens is the starter, you know, you put the headers on and then you find out, you know, a year later, you got to put a starter in. Well, you can't get the starter far enough forward to get it out. So you got to take the headers back off. And the headers are, they're not fun to work with. Um, got another issue here. Uh, I noticed that... Uh, Pete's push rod is in the bottom hole. Well, you've got some oil leaks and stuff. This is pretty typical seepage. But, but being in the bottom hole will actually give you the least amount of throw um, for the amount of uh, <sighs> thrust or, you know, from the amount of movement that you get out of the wheel cylinder itself you know, out of the piston and the wheel cylinder, um, being in the bottom hole is going to give you the least amount of actual throw on the the um, clutch, uh, well, clutch fork, oh, basically, yeah. or, or the, the, the clutch arm. The higher up it is, the more throw you get, but also you'll notice at the pedal, the, the more effort it takes. Now, Pete's also got in here a, um, an electric fuel pump. And I think still going through the original. Yeah. Yes, yes. Which the previous owner did bother to tell me about, and it's actuated by a rocker switch, which I inadvertently turned off on the way home from buying the car, and it and it quit. So, running. so, so, what you're saying then is that the uh, the that mechanical awesome. mechanical pump is not working. Okay. Pete's got oh, okay. So he's got headers. He's got a single exhaust. He comes out with with. Uh, with one exhaust tip, uh, no, uh, you know, that's a that's perfectly fine. I notice he's got some kind of wacko um, um, mounts here, which again, you know, as long as they're tight and as long as they work, um, no big deal. Uh, with the stock system, a lot of times what happens is uh, the the uh, the mounting um, points are either uh, broken or uh, they get loose. Uh, there are some rubber straps. Uh, the straps will get loose or they'll break and the, the exhaust system will sit here in the tunnel and rattle. Uh, I kind of like the stock system because it's got a nice sound to it. Uh, another thing that this goes on back here is you've got these um, 
rear axle bearing assemblies, which are a little bit, they're not exactly complex, but they're a real pain in the butt because in order to replace them, and these, this one has got a little bit of play in it, but probably not too worrisome. I'd probably let this one go for a while. Um, mostly, we don't see the axle bearing, um, the axle bearings going bad. What happens is they wear enough that, um, and because it's attached to the, you know, the wheel's attached to the flange, the flange is, the way the, way the thing is assembled, you'll feel, you'll feel um, some play on the wheel. Now you can feel some play on this one. You can maybe hear that. Yeah. And this one feels good, feels nice and solid. The other problem that these things have is that these axles, uh, it's a splined axle and it can move in and out. And what happens is, you know, they don't get lubricated by, there's really nothing to lubricate them uh, except for the initial lubrication. And uh, these have boots on them and a lot of times the boots will get torn up. You'll get sand and debris and stuff in there, water. And, you know, as these things move back and forth, they start to uh, wear and you'll feel the wear also in, in like a forward backward motion. These feel okay. That feels okay. We want to look at the U joints. There's a little bit of play in the U joints. I didn't really hear anything real significant when I was driving the car, but I do note that. Let's see where. If you look at, if you look here, um, you'll see that there's um, uh, the the cup is actually turning in the yoke, so that's a little bit loose. You can see, you see the right there. You can see how it's been turning in there. So that's a little bit loose. Um, it's something to keep an eye on if you're starting to hear more and more of a clunk from the rear when you're shifting or when you, especially like when you put it in reverse and then you put it in forward and you get a clunk. I mean, it can be a bunch of things. If you have wire wheels, your wire wheels could be loose. Um, it could be this um, bearing because as if this bearing is worn, you know, when you move forward, the um, uh, you'll you'll vary the sort of the thrust and also vary the way that the um, you know like the back end will raise or lower a little bit, and that'll cause this thing. You know, if it was really worn, and I've seen some that you know you could get like an inch of of movement out of them, and you know when you move forward and backward with that, then you'll get a clunk from that. So you can get a clunk from the bearing, you can get a clunk from the U joint. You can get a click or a clunk from the splines. And then there's the last thing, you, get a, you can get a clunk from the differential. The other thing that you'll notice is there'll be rust that'll start to uh, develop between the, the cruciform plate and the, the, um, the frame itself. So these areas here will start to kind of, um, they'll start to expand a little bit. They'll start to kind of bubble out. And it's because there's rust that's forcing the two things apart. The, the two plates apart. Um, but a lot of times we see rust in here and we see rust in here. And that's something to, to keep, just to keep a, an eye on on your car. This one looks pretty good. Um, one of the things I noticed, uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, when the car's on the ground, the, the rear end of the vehicle bounces very easily. And I'm pretty sure that these shocks are gone. They're, the only way really to, to be absolutely certain is to take the shock link off and actually try and move the arm. Um, I'm pretty sure that in this case, uh, we definitely have um, uh, some uh, worn out shocks. But another semi indicator is there's supposed to be a buffer right here. And that buffer usually sticks up about an inch or so. When it's crushed like that, that's usually because there's so much movement on the car that it's pounding it rather than just hitting it lightly, it's pounding it pretty hard. So you can see this one's crushed and this one's also crushed. You can see it's supposed to look like this up here. This guy at the top, you see that? 
It's supposed to look like that, and that's the one that's right there. Uh, another point of weakness on these cars is on the front suspension, um, these brackets that hold the, um, uh, the A-arm uh, brackets is, uh, that hold the A-arms, um, these things will oftentimes develop, develop cracks in here. So you have to keep an eye on those. These look good. And it's obvious that um, Pete's had some uh, front suspension work done here. He's got either a rebuilt, or a, I'm sorry, either a new bottom plate here or somebody's done a pretty nice job of painting it. He's got new springs, new upper A arms. The upper A arm bushings are another place that's, that's weak on these cars. A lot of times you'll see this bushing peeled out. Uh, Pete's got um, uh, urethane style bushings in there. Um, this wheel bearing is very slightly loose. And let's see. I see he's also got the drilled and the, the drilled rotors, which is kind of nice. Um, the A arm bushings are a point of weakness to, where the A arm attaches to the A arm bracket. Um, again, these are all brand new. But this wheel bearing is in definite need of at least adjustment. At this point, you might, you know, you're going to want to take it, take at least the outer bearing out and take a look at it and make sure that it's not actually um, badly worn. Um, I was going to talk about brake hoses. Uh, brake hoses are probably good for maybe 20, 25 years. But what happens with the stock? brake hose is over a long period of time it'll start to occlude the the uh, material that it's made of will start to swell a little bit and eventually it'll actually swell until the the um, until it closes up um, one of the ways that you can tell that that's happening is uh, you're driving down the road you hit the brakes first the car goes one way and then it goes the other way as you as you continue the pressure on the brakes what, what's happening, and that's the very beginning of that. Usually what it means is one of your brake hoses is starting to um, occlude and it's not allowing as much pressure through as, as, the, as the other one. And you know, it's, you can really tell on the front. It's much harder to tell on the rear. The sensation when you've got one brake hose that's starting to go is, is, is pretty obvious. What happens is the side that is not occluded will get pressure so that brake will grab and it'll pull you in that direction. And then as you push harder, it'll push fluid through the occluded hose because it's not completely occluded yet. And you'll get pressure to the other side. So now it'll start to try and pull back the other way. So the pressure of your pushing on the brake pedal and the pressure that's, that's uh, generated by your foot is going to be a whole lot more than sort of the spring pressure of the fluid trying to come back. So you'll push fluid through, it'll put the brakes on, and then the brakes won't release. I basically recommend that, you know, if your brake hoses are original, you're lucky that you've gotten this far, and probably the thing to do would be to just replace them. Let's uh, take a look at Bill. I'm trying to remember if there was anything about Bill's car over here. Okay, and this is an example of this car has had the rear if you look at the at the uh, right front uh, differential mount bracket, you can see there's a plate on that side there. Uh, this one has been repaired. Now, they boxed they boxed the right front one in completely, and the left front one, they only put one. Um, uh, one plate on the side of the now actually you can see it's got one plate there and no plate on the other side and this one has got both plates on it uh, the mounts themselves look like they're I think they're the um, they're another version of the urethane style I noticed a little, a little tiny bit of clunk um, on both of these cars when I was driving it. 
I'm feeling the, the U joints. And his axle his axle boot here is open, so you can get oh, yeah. um, water and and uh, uh, sand and stuff like that in there on this. The other side is also completely open. Um, hey, has anybody gone to Hunter yet? I need one. All right, one is it difficult to replace those boots? Well, you have to take the axle out, which means you have to take the um, axle bearing out. So while it's not difficult, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit time consuming. Um, there's another thing about about the um, uh, when we're doing the uh, rear axle bearings on these things. The, the axle bearings are held in um, with six studs. And what people have a tendency to do when they put those things back together, these studs go into this uh, trailing arm, which is aluminum. And people, it's a, if I remember right, it's a fine thread um, bolt into aluminum. It's very easy uh, when you turn that nut down to turn it down too hard, um, put too much torque on it and uh, pop the threads and basically pull the, the stud right out. So whenever I'm doing a rear axle bearing on one of these cars, uh, I'll put helicoils in, which are uh, stainless steel screw inserts. Um, I'll, I'll put those in, and then when you put it back together, you know, you don't torque the heck out of it. Um, you know, probably 20 pounds is, is more than enough. Um, when the brakes get de-adjusted or they get worn a little bit, you know, it takes a little bit more uh, pedal throw to move those shoes out to contact the drum. And the, the farther you have to, to, you know, to push that brake shoe out, the farther down the pedal has to go in order to make that contact. So when you adjust the brakes, you get the brakes again closer to the drum so that it takes very little movement in order to make contact. Um, oftentimes, just doing a, a brake adjustment will help to uh, bring the pedal up. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll adjust his brakes before he gets out of here. It's, it's best not to bend them too many times. Uh, bend them. in the back are not connected correctly and you've got bad sockets. Bad sockets. Yeah, you got everything. Click <laughs> short it. The one that's bright. Yeah. 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 And on one side, unfortunately, this bulb socket is Not connecting. I'm going to solder that stuff. Standing around this car, and Dave was doing his thing. Could get up. Yeah. 
Getting, uh, not getting power through the circuit, so. On which one, brakes? No, uh, the uh, reverse, uh, the reverse lights. But the reverse lights, we're not gonna worry about. I mean, you can worry about it if you want to, but not today. Why do you think it's not getting? Uh, either the switch on the transmission or power to the transmission. Uh, it goes through the fuse box. Uh, goes to a switch on the top of the transmission and you put it in reverse that closes the switch and then switch power back here but you're not getting any power back here now i noticed that you've got um uh it looks like you've got sockets that have ground wires on them but there's no power getting to it anyway so that's the first thing there we go. Yeah. Is it the bulb? <laughs> yeah, it had a bad bulb. Now, interestingly, this one, this particular socket's got a uh, uh, ground wire, a ground, a ground connection. So it's a little wider than the other one? Uh, I don't know. Is it? Uh, you want it's not linking. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, no, you don't put your hazards on. You can see oh, both of them. Oh, yeah, the hazard switch doesn't work. It's a 1971 Triumph TR6. I bought it three years ago. Uh, I learned that uh, the car is in pretty good condition, but there's a few areas that still need to be uh, brought up to snuff. Well, I had a problem with my brake lights, and we got that taken care of today. Uh, there's also an issue with the rear shocks that uh, they need to be replaced. I could drive it as is, but you know, for it to be a, a good runner, they should be addressed. Mm -hmm. 